Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, delighted to welcome you to this webinar. And um, I'm Jonathan Spear, Deputy Chief Executive of Infrastructure Victoria, and um, really glad that you can join us for us to discuss the findings of Infrastructure Victoria's work on transporting Melbourne's recovery, the immediate policy actions to get Melbourne moving. And I'd like to introduce you to members of the project team as well who are with us today. Uh, we have Neil France, who um, is one of Infrastructure Victoria's uh, infrastructure advisors and who's done lots of work on, and you'll be hearing from him today. And also Daniel Harrison, who is a principal economist with Infrastructure Victoria. And later on, um, we'll be joined by Madeleine Brennan, um, who will be facilitating today's uh, question and answer session. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong lands on which uh, most of us are located, and um, pay my uh, respects to the traditional owners and um, their elders, past and present, um, and any Aboriginal elders of other communities who might be with us today. To give you a bit of a brief introduction, um, earlier this year, Infrastructure Victoria released a report to assist um, the Victorian government in um, developing a policy that would be able to balance the safety and performance of the transport system, along with economic recovery, um, as we were starting to emerge from the COVID related lockdowns from last year. And of course, we've since then um, been through a similar period of lockdown and are now emerging again. And that makes this research we've undertaken particularly relevant. And um, you know, hot off the press, the, the data on mobility, which we've been able to look at um, just from the last few days, tells us that um, you know, driving in around Melbourne is almost back to, to baseline levels the way it was pre-COVID. By contrast, public transport use still remains well down, between 50 and 75% down compared to pre-COVID. So we're definitely seeing some patterns emerging, which, which um, Neil and Daniel will explain further as what we saw in our research as well. And workplaces in the central city still hovering at around 50% occupancy. When we look across the city, traffic congestion across Melbourne has rebounded just since last Friday when we had the easing of restrictions. And it's already close to 2019 congestion levels. And in some cases, it's surpassing the levels of congestion that we saw in 2020. And so, of course, COVID-19 has significantly impacted, you know, when and where and how Victorians travel. And as restrictions start to ease, what we have identified as some elements of a good new normal living um, with COVID as we emerge is that if we have flexible start and finish times, if we have more off peak fares, if we're able to encourage more active transport, those are some of the elements of the formula to reduce Melbourne's worsening congestion and get Melbourne moving again as workers return to the city. So in today's session, Neil and Daniel will step you through a presentation from our report um, and then we'll be opening up our webinar for questions later on. What you can do is on the right hand side of your screen in the discussion panel, you can enter into, uh, into the, any questions into there and please do include the, the name uh, and organisation. And then while we won't be able to answer necessarily every single question uh, in the time allocated, we'll, we'll address as many as possible after the presentation. And we'll also be recording this presentation and making it available in the next few days uh, for, for anybody to, to either look at again or, or share with your network. Um, and speaking of sharing with your network, we're on Twitter and we're on LinkedIn, so do feel free to continue the conversation on social media. Um, so before I hand over to, to Neil and then Daniel, uh, just a quick reminder about the role of Infrastructure Victoria. We are the state's independent infrastructure advisor and we do three main things. Um, we publish a 30 year infrastructure strategy, which uh, many of you will be aware that we released an update of that um, just a couple of months ago. Um, we also publish original research on infrastructure related matters. And what we're talking about today is part of that stream of research where we have looked at the practical implications and opportunities 
that government has to respond to COVID and um, forge a better new normal. The other function that Infrastructure Victoria performs is to provide advice to government on infrastructure matters. Um, so for example, we are currently giving advice to the government on the role of gas infrastructure in the transition towards meeting uh, net zero targets that the state has. So our work is really focused on ensuring that Victorians get the right infrastructure at the right time and they get the infrastructure that they need the most. And we think that as part of that, infrastructure planning that is long-term and integrated is really important part of that. So the options we're putting forward in our Transporting Movements Recovery Report are designed for practical short-term impl implementation, but they do deliver benefits for government and industry and commuters through better use of infrastructure and safer and more reliable journeys in the medium and the long term as well. I'll now hand over to Neil to talk through the work and look forward to joining you again when we come to the question and answer time. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Jonathan, and hello and welcome to everyone in the audience. Now, let me take you through the introduction and frame some of the work that uh, we're about to present here. Next slide, please, Tolly. So this report was IV's first piece of modelling to understand the implications of COVID-19, specifically for transport. We, as Jonathan said, released this in early 2021, and that was for, or in response, or in, sorry, in preparation for Melbourne's recovery period following that second wave that we had. Now, in the report, we provide immediate interventions for the Victorian government to consider. And as part of those interventions, they, they are, a range of options to enable safe and confident travel to get Melbourne moving again as we see workers returning to their places of work. Next slide please. Now to set the context, as I said, it's it's the modelling that we did here, the work that we did was to provide insight into how transport in Melbourne is likely to operate, transitioning into that COVID normal, that COVID recovery period. To contextualise the situation, uh, situation, it's a stage where we have a risk of COVID in the community, but there's no lockdowns. However, there are those behavioural changes, a, a slight greater preference for cars, lower preference for public transport. It's a time where we have, and what we're experiencing now, worsening congestion, but poor PT utilisation. And I think we'd all agree here, that is not the direction we want Melbourne or the city to be heading in. Now, our work talks through options, policy options, reform ideas to avoid locking in entrenched transport habits, poor transport habits, avoid risks to the long-term damage of Melbourne's livability and also our economic recovery. Now, there's been quite a few things that have happened in the last few months, a lot to do with the vaccine. And despite those developments mid to late 2021 in reducing the need, so with, with vaccines now, in circulation, reducing the need for strict travel directives, the demand management fundamentals that we're going to talk through here today remain core to the recovery. So in other words, many of these options make good sense at any time. However, they make great sense for a COVID recovery period. Next slide, please. So let me talk you through the project stages. Stage one modelling the pre-COVID base case. This is Melbourne's business as usual transport network, pre-COVID. We then, stage two, worked with Veach Lister Consulting, looking at some of, researching some of the COVID trends, the COVID impacts, what happens to public transport patronage, private vehicles, working from home, that's a really big one, airport travel and international students. So we looked at data, we looked at survey data, mobility data from Apple and Google, um, all of these data sets to try and work out what Melbourne's recovery period might look like. And to help with that, we also looked across at different cities across Australia. We looked at New Zealand too. Many of those cities were actually in a later stage of their recovery. They weren't, they, they were ahead of Melbourne. So that gave us a good idea to, uh, to try and estimate what Melbourne's recovery might look like. I might just quickly ask my other presenters to make sure their mics are muted. Thanks guys. Step three, 
modeling the COVID-19 scenarios. So this is where we took those assumptions that we researched which, with Veach Lister Consulting, and we modeled them. We used IV's Melbourne Activity and Agent-Based Model, shortened to the MABM. And one of the benefits of using an agent-based model is that we can really get into the detail of individuals moving across the network. We can look at their household income, how policy impacts individual people rather than the general population. And this really helps because things like working from home, they're really targeted. They can only apply to people who practically can work from home. So it really helps the tool, really helps us in coming up with these scenarios, these COVID scenarios. We had two of them. These two scenarios were called the core scenario and the dialed up COVID scenario. So these were our best guess or best estimate of what Melbourne's recovery might look like. Stage four, we modelled these. We assessed the results. We analysed some of the results on road congestion, on public transport crowding. And then we asked ourselves the question, what reform should we be, or what, what types of reform can target some of the challenges that we're seeing coming out of the modelling? Step five, we created two further reform scenarios. So these, you can think of them as alternative futures. They represented some of the modelling that included policy options in response to COVID-19. And we're calling them the flexible work and the active uptake scenarios. There's some hints in the names there. I'll go through the details shortly. Next slide, please. Now let's begin with some of the COVID impacts research that we undertook. And I'm gonna, I'll begin with one of the biggest ones, working from home. Next slide. So looking across all the data sets we had, we identified in the short to immediate, immediate to short term, workplace activity was likely to recover to between 80 and 90% of pre-COVID-19 levels. Now this wasn't just looking at Melbourne, but looking towards Sydney, Western Australia, Queensland, even Auckland in New Zealand, to best identify what sort of level of working from home we're gonna see. So in other terms, 10 to 20% of people continuing to work from home uh, during that COVID recovery period. Now I wanna point your attention to the diagram the bottom right there. What that shows is the destination location of trips that were once being taken, but now no longer are being taken on the network because of working from home. And you can see a big spike in Melbourne CBD. And to no surprise to anyone, that is where the location of most jobs that can work from home are located. Now there's a second peak in that picture as well. I'll come to that in a moment, but a quick hint to that, it's Tullamarine Airport. Next slide, please. Public transport and cars. This was another big um, impact or a big change that we, applied, we observed and then applied in our modeling. So the first big one is a decline in public transport usage, public transport usage or patronage. Even in cities with minimal cases, PT doesn't seem to recover to baseline levels. It drops in lockdowns, in outbreaks, but it plateaus in its recovery. It doesn't really get back to that 100% of baseline levels. It's a phenomenon that's occurred across the world now. We've seen it multiple times. There's no surprise here. PT does not bounce back as quickly as private vehicles and cars. With private vehicles, we see as Jonathan said at the start of this presentation, we're seeing it here now in Melbourne, a bounce back to baseline levels. There was a period in just after our second, second wave and as we just started that second recovery period or that first recovery period, that traffic on major arterials in Melbourne, for example, Punt Road, they, travel times on those roads were actually higher we got to a point where travel times were higher than pre-COVID-19, which is quite, um, quite a measure when you put things in context here. So this, a lot of this data came from Google and Apple mobility data, and you can see the assumptions that we, the, that we input into our model at the bottom of that table there. Next slide, please. Now, you may remember I pointed out Tullamarine Airport and a big spike there. That's because many trips that occurred or went to and from Tullamarine Airport no longer occurred during COVID. We had international borders shut, domestic borders shut. We 
saw a huge drop off in airport travel or airport related travel during that COVID recovery period. Now, as Melbourne opens up to other states, potentially other countries with border bubbles or, or, or travel bubbles, we might see that slightly recover. But in immediate to short term, we're probably not going to see a huge recovery anywhere near close to, to going back to baseline levels. The other aspect of international borders is Melbourne's market or Victoria's market in international students. Now, one of the benefits, again, of having an agent based model is we're able to identify some of the demographics or the um, types of people who may be affected by international borders being shut. And you can see in the bottom right diagram there, the darker the pink square, the more people that were removed from our model because they simply were not in the country. And you can see international students um, around RMIT, Melbourne Uni campuses, out towards the southeast in Monash as well, where you can see a lot of trips being removed from the network. Next slide, please. So I've spoken through some of the impacts research. These, this impacts research helped us to formulate two scenarios. These are the core and dialed up scenarios. The core was our most accurate representation of Melbourne's recovery that IV could predict. Our dialed up scenario is a bit more of a sensitivity test on that. We dial up the impact and what it represents is a, an even larger travel behaviour change and economic disruption to Melbourne, just to get an idea of the different, the different impacts and the different levels um, on the network. Next slide, please. So running those two scenarios, running the core and the dialed up scenarios, these are the results. And there's a few stories I wanna talk you through here. The first relates to that top right diagram that you see. These diagrams, red represents an increase in car volumes. And the story behind this is the commuter that lives in those middle to inner mid to middle suburbs who have good access to PT. They used to take pre-COVID, the train, the tram, perhaps even the bus to work. Because of COVID, they're thinking twice about that. They're thinking because of the perceived potential health risk of taking public transport, of potentially catching COVID-19, they're thinking about taking the private vehicle to work instead of driving. There are lots of people that would be thinking this. And what happens is that we see higher levels of car volumes in that inner city area. The other reason there's lots of people is because inner and middle Melbourne have really good public transport. So there, there's the potential for a lot of people to be thinking, perhaps I should be taking a car to work the next day. The second story here is the bottom right and blue on this diagram represents a reduction in private vehicle volumes. This is the story of the worker that actually travels to work every day by car, pre-COVID-19. And that's because one, they, they choose to or two, in those outer suburbs, there's really not much other choice for them to do. There is lower levels of public tra transport, um, public transport service kilometers in those areas and therefore they drove the car already to, co uh, to work pre-COVID. Because of COVID, they now have this second option of working from home. And because of that, we actually see a reduction in car volumes in those outer areas. So overall, what does that mean for cars? Road congestion in inner metro is the problem here. We see 100,000 additional car trips, so 15% increase. That increases average or reduces average speeds, excuse me, by 20 to 30% to pre-COVID-19. So that's around down to 21 kilometers per hour in the AM peak. You can ride a bike faster than that. We also looked at public transport and looked at some of the, I'm not gonna call it crowding because it, it isn't, but with COVID-19, we're looking at different opportunities on the rail network where physical distancing is possible, where we can have quite a bit of space between commuters. And what we find in terms of time periods, the, the, the real problem time period is that morning peak. That's when we're going to have the most demand of people wanting to use the rail network especially to head to work. So I'm going to talk through some of the reform ideas shortly. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to talk you now through two of the alternative future COVID scenarios and we'll begin on this side. Thank you. Uh, what I've just explained to you is a dilemma. 
it, it presented a dilemma for Melbourne's transport network. We have high levels of working from home, but still high levels of private vehicle congestion. You saw those stats on inner metro. We also had a shift away from public transport. People aren't utilising the PT that we once had in place as much as they um, did pre-COVID. So even, and also, despite there being a fall in PT usage, we only had a selection of services that really were able to provide opportunity for people to physically distance on their commute. So we created two further alternative futures and we modelled them. And we've called them the active uptake and the flexible work scenarios. Active uptake takes this opportunity of the untapped mode that we've got here, which is active transport, cycling and walking. We saw a uh, we, we modelled a 50% increase in active mode share for inner metro. And these were for only for the trips that are practical to walk or cycle. So really short trip trips for those walking um, trips and then slightly longer for cycling trips. And what that does is helps to shift that demand away from the at capacity roads, which are congested essentially, and public transport. Now the second scenario, the second alternative future here is the flexible work scenario. And this is where we, you'll remember that I said 10 to 20% was our, was our range of working from home. We increased this to 25% to see what sort of impact that would have on the network. But this wasn't the only thing that we did. The other also important aspect was a change to hybrid work, greater flexibility in work hours, being able to get to work, start work earlier in the day and perhaps finish earlier in the day as well, or, or essentially trying to manage that really big peak commuter spike that we had pre-COVID in those early hours of the morning and later in the afternoon. So those were the two scenarios. I'll talk you through what we found in those alternative futures on the next slide. Firstly, active uptake, more people walking, more people cycling. We saw, or we took 265,000 trips within inner metro and put them onto the active transport network. So that's taking them away for, uh, taking them away from the roads and taking them away from public transport. What does that mean for the drivers that are remaining on the roads that um, that that need to use the roads? Well, essentially 18 minutes of time stuck in traffic per week for every inner Melbourne car driver is taken away. They no longer have to sit through that. A reduction of 40,000 delay hours on those roads. Now, the flexible work scenario was an interesting one. And there's two figures down below to help talk you through those. What a simple change in the time of day that you're allowed to um, arrive at work did was that it incentivized over 80,000 earlier work trips. And you can see in the figure on the bottom left there, that pink line, the flexible work scenario, you can see that that has flattened that peak around 8 to 8.30 and shifted and helped spread that demand across the train network, allowing more services to have more room to physically distance. Next slide, please. So I've spoken, talked you through the results. I've talked you through the reform options, um, the scenarios. The last question that remains here is, what are some of the policy levers? What are the reform opportunities to help incentivize some of the behavior that I've spoken through? The behavior of uh, increasing walking and cycling, the behavior to introduce flexible start and finish times. What levers are there to increase working from home? Daniel will talk you through that now. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks very much, Neil. And yeah, so this section, we're gonna talk through what some of the options are to do some of the things that we saw were achievable in our modeling. We saw some you know, really big benefits from increasing, say, active uh, uptake, from seeing more flexible work, but that's all very well in the model, but how in the real world can the government actually incentivize those things or create um, the room for those things to happen? So next slide, thanks. So the first thing that we discuss is essentially monitoring social distancing levels and also using government directives and guidance. The key here is, as Neil's just pointed out, what we saw in our modelling was a significant decrease in public transport use. What we've seen in the real world, both in our research since and before, was that public transport use has gone down. 
And so the main purpose of our recommendations here is to support confidence in the public transport system. We want people to feel safe and confident to use public transport because the alternative, if it's driving, is severe congestion that clogs up our city and also discourages economic activity because people will be like, well, yeah, it's too congested. So some of the things that we've talked about in this section are mask use, um, and that's something that you know, we've seen the Victorian government do throughout this pandemic, but particularly on public transport, that's a place where it can um, really encourage people to feel safe. Also providing real-time crowding data, which is something that Sydney uh, did some trials with, and now Victoria has a Ride Space app, which gives you real-time information on the crowding on public transport and really allows people to, to look at what's happening in public transport and say, oh, this service is quite uncrowded. I feel very confident to go and, and use that. Um, and also, you know, things like regular cleaning, making sure things um, are, you know, are, are clean and that people have confidence that, that their cleaning is happening. And these are all things that the Victorian government has, has uh, done throughout this pandemic and things that we'll likely see continue going forward. Um, other things that we talked about was reducing contact points. This is something that um, New South Wales is quite a bit of, um, and we've done some to a limited extent here, but essentially not having to touch things as much on public transport. So doors are automatically open on trams, on trains, on buses, um, signage um, and hints to help people visualise preferred behaviour. So you can see there in the image that there's some stuff from New South Wales where they, they basically said, this is a, a seat that you can use, this is a seat you, can't, you, know, you shouldn't use, this is what social distancing looks like. Um, and these are all things that can encourage people to feel that public transport is a good option. So while things continue to change in the in different stages of the pandemic, um, and now that we have vaccines, the kind of risk preferences of people will be adapting. The main point still remains that we need to retain confidence in public transport. As our modelling shows that sustained car use into the future is, is not a preferable future. It's something that we, we don't want to see. If you go to the next slide. The next section is some pricing mechanisms. And so we looked at things that we can do with pricing to encourage our behavior to tackle some of the, the issues that we see in the modeling that we've seen in the real world in those times of recovery um, earlier on. The first one is implement permanent off-peak public transport fares across all modes. As we've already talked about, public transport becomes less attractive. Um, and, and, and even in our modelling where people were avoiding public transport, there, there still remained some physical distancing issues on some services. And so to counter these issues, we recommend off-peak fares to spread the load into less crowded off-peaks. Um, as, as Neil showed earlier, the, the, the real problem with the services were the peak ones. In the off-peak, there was a lot more room, uh, an ample room for physical distancing. Now government increased uh, and introduced temporary off-peak fares and this showed great signs of success um, in the period where they were available. You can see, you may have seen some media articles around the, the extra people that used off-peak services when those off-peak fares were introduced. Sadly, that has ended and it ended on August 27th. And once again, Melbourne has no off-peak fare discounts outside the early bird for trains. But we believe that there are huge benefits to be had from off-peak fares. And we also think that off-peak fares will have even greater benefits as flexible work is adopted post-COVID. And you can see that in this um, chart from our, our modelling. And, and Neil's talked to this earlier. You can see the huge, the blue line drop off um, in the flexible work scenario where people are, are working from home more. And you can see that huge decrease there. But you can also see it that earlier in the morning, that kind of blue spike in the early AM is people shifting their work time earlier to essentially because of more, more flexible work. Um, and presumably there's also that in the afternoon. The, the problem here is you can't, you can't see that easily on the graph because of the, the amount of people who are working from home dominates that effect. But essentially, if we're going back into a world where people's workplaces are more flexible than they have ever been, where the, you can choose the days of the week that you work, or you might be able to choose the hours that you work and when you start and you finish, then these pricing mechanisms such as off-peak fares become even more useful because it incentivizes people to change their behavior in a, in a space where they actually have that choice, where previously not a lot of people were able to shift their start times. 
if we can go to the next slide, you'll see um, a survey that was taken um, not long after the kind of COVID became endemic and essentially saw that 60% of people would be more likely to change their time of travel and particularly public transport if they were off peak fares provided. And that is a significant number of people. And I think that was you know, it essentially impacted by COVID and working from home and the more flexible work practices that we'd seen even earlier on. It's also interesting to see that other things that were able to help kind of encourage people to um, shift their, their, their work times and, and make more flexible work practices were things like access to real-time information when services are crowded, which we now have. Um, and also, if you could change my work or education hours, which again will be more likely. And so combined, we think that there's real scope for off-peak fares to have an impact to, again, in, you know, basically support the public transport system, in, enable more physical distancing, and also you know, encourage people to use that over driving their cars. We also believe off-peak fares will aid economic recovery because off-peak fares don't just aim to shift people's time of travel. That's obviously one of the purposes, but it's not the only purpose. They also encourage underused services in the off-peak. And this reduces car congestion on during the day and particularly on weekends when car congestion can be quite high. And those people shift over to public transport because it is cheaper. But it also generates new trips that would otherwise not have occurred. So this is increased shopping, social entertainment in an economy that is re in recovery, which is something that's going to be very valuable. So combined, these are the kind of reasons we think that off-peak fares are something that would be really important in the recovery stage. And our work that we've published in our strategy and, and fair move and good move also show that off-peak fares is something that we would like to see permanent because we believe it does have benefits um, ongoing into the future. If we have the next slide. We also talk about the free tram zone. Now the free tram zone is something that we have been pretty vocal about in the past and you can read more in our strategy, in our good and fair move reports um, and in our parliamentary submission to the free tram zone extension. But to boil it down, we, we think the free tram zone is a pretty poor idea. We think it encourages driving to the city discourages active transport within the city and it results in severe crowding and congestion that makes it very difficult for people who really need the services to use it. People who are perhaps they're, they're pregnant, um, they have a disability um, or who are, who are elderly, those are the people who most need the transport and you know it's been a long time now but if you can cast your minds back to those free tram services it was great that they were free but they were also really really packed and uncomfortable particularly around lunch times. And in a pandemic, we think that it's an even worse idea because the impacts of crowding congestion are themselves worse. Before it was about discomfort, about not being able to get on services, about having to wait. But now it's also about you know, the risk of transmission, of spreading COVID. And so we think now is actually a really good time to let the free tram zone go. Uh, we also don't find that there's much or any evidence that it attracts tourism. And what local economic activity it may attract often comes at the expense of other retailers in other areas of Melbourne that don't have free local transport. Um, we can also see there that, that it does actually make a significant difference. So if we see that there's now 35 million trips in the free tram zone up from 18 and a half million pre free tram zone. And obviously there's been population growth and change in that time. But in the first year alone, there was a 30% increase in patronage. Um, and, and this is a you know basically a tram network that's got the busiest route in the world running through a free area, which is overly congested. So next slide, please. We also talked a bit about pricing mechanisms for active. So we know that there are significant benefits to the transport network from a shift to active transport. In our modelling, um, we showed that we increased 142,000 cycling trips each day to, from and within Intermetro. And combined with walking trips, this resulted in a reduction of 40,000 delay hours for Intermetro road congestion. And Neil's already talked you through the many benefits that can come by shifting people to active transport. However, increasing cycling, uh, particularly for commuting, has previously proven very difficult. And we think that the return of workers to the office after such a long and extended time away provides unprecedented opportunity to reset how people commute and to try new ways of commuting. 
you know, previously, you know, everyone was very ingrained in their daily habits. We all did the same things. We went to work, you know, often every day, we either chose the road or public transport. Um, but now those, 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 we don't really have those patterns anymore. And, and now's a great time to reset and say, well, why don't we try some other modes? Um, and people may find that they, they suit them very well. And one way we talked about in doing that in our report was providing a financial incentive of some kind for people to ride to work. And one of the ones that we favoured was a kind of Belgium style. And we'll talk a bit about that in a minute, but basically a per kilometre trial that would encourage people to ride rather than take public transport or drive. And we favoured a trial because it's not known how big the impact would be on use. And because the trial itself could be a great nudge to encourage people to try it out. While more evidence is needed on how a successful scheme like this would be in Melbourne, we do know that the Melbourne Metro business case talks about a dollar twenty per kilometre in benefits from removing cars from roads, and we know that adding capacity to public transport is very expensive. So, particularly for trains, where it can cost you know around fourteen dollars to add a kind of additional public transport trip in the long run with with capital costs. And evidence from overseas does suggest that such schemes do result in new riders, but also in an additional frequency for those who already ride, both of which could have benefits. Bicycle Network had a campaign around this uh, at the last election, so it's not entirely a new idea. Um, and so it's something that we think it would be worth looking at as an option, um, particularly kind of a short-term option in this reset phase. Um, and looking at Belgium, where incidentally many famous cyclists have come from, uh, their scheme works out at around 23 euro cents a kilometre and it's considered to be quite successful. But what's interesting, and we'll, this links to what we'll be talking about um, in some of the next sections, is that there are a lot of other things going on in cycling. So you've got a map of, of Belgium here and you can kind of see the different colours of the percentage of commuter cyclists. And what you can see is while the, the scheme is across all of Belgium, we see that in the north, um, there's a lot bigger uptake of cycling than in the south. And that's obviously got nothing to do with cycling incentives, but all the other things. And so in particular, the, the, the geography in the north is flatter. So it's easier to cycle, which has a big impact. Consequently, they have a bigger cycling culture, which has a, another impact. Um, and what's also very interesting is that you see that as density increases, cycling commuting increases. Um, but then once you get to a certain level of density, so those major cities like the like Brussels, it actually reverses and less people commute by bike. And the reason is, is because those cities are so busy and their road networks are so large that cyclists feel less safe. And so all of these things contribute to, to whether someone chooses to ride to work and safety is the number one thing. And we have quite a bit to say in the next sessions on that. Next slide, thanks. Um, as part of kind of monitoring crowded congestion and also as part of the, the suite of things you can do in combination with off-peak fares, we talk about more off-peak services. Um, and government has added hundreds of off-peak services uh, during the pandemic, and this has helped create capacity for more off-peak travel and, and enable more opportunity for physical distancing. Um, also, you know, greater frequency also makes public transport more attractive because if trains and buses or trams are more frequent, then turn up and go becomes easier, there's more space and people will gravitate more to public transport. So combined with off-peak fares, we think this is a great way to encourage more flexible work. We go to the next slide, thanks. Now, in our past modelling, we've talked about around 240. 204,000 daily car and public transport pickout trips could be cycled or walked. Um, and we've seen the proliferation of e-bikes is also creating new opportunities for cycling, significantly reducing the physical effort required to commute by bicycle and increasing the distance that people are willing to ride. So cycling has a huge amount of momentum behind it. However, the number one barrier, as I've already mentioned, for people who could cycle in Melbourne, but don't, is safety. That remains the number one thing that people want to kind of be able to get out there is, is the feeling that they will be safe. Um, and there's some great research done here by the City of Melbourne 
where they looked at some cautious riders and asked them questions about how confident they would be in different types of, of road networks. And clearly having a bicycle lane just in and of itself encourages people to ride more, but the type of bicycle lane becomes very important as well. So you can see um, in those images, so if you've got the one on the far right, you've got 22% of cautious riders are confident to ride on a bike lane that has parked cars on the left. It's not, not a lot of cautious cyclists are particularly keen to head out on that. So you've provided space for them, but you haven't made that space feel safe. 29% of cautious riders are confident on the middle image where you can see that you've got your own lane, but you don't have any cars on your left-hand side. So you're only now worried about the cars on your right. But where you see real gains is that final image on the left, which is 83% of cautious riders are confident in a, in a lane that essentially has no parked cars on their left and has some kind of physical barrier between them and the traffic. And so here it's you know just a small little strip on the road, but that in and of itself creates a real feeling of safety from, from the other cars. And so we've seen trials of um, extra cycling lanes scattered throughout this pandemic. And this is something that we've talked about in the past infrastructure, Victoria, that we want to see more cycling lanes added and we want more of those to be segregated. And we think that this is an opportunity as we come out of this recovery period and we want to encourage people to ride and to try this, that we should build and invest in, in cycling infrastructure that makes people feel safe. And this is also a great thing to do in the long term because in the long term, this is something that can take a lot of pressure off our roads and also off our public transport um, networks. And if you're looking at modern you know, global cities, um, continuing to rely on cars is just not really a viable way forward. But if you want to encourage people to you know, shift active transport, you have to provide a safe environment for them to do so. Next slide, thanks. We also talk about, oh, sorry, one back there. Um, supporting local government to reallocate parking and road space for pedestrians um, and economic activity. So greater levels of walking trips as shown in our active uptake scenario may result in high levels of crowding on footpaths. And past consultation with the city of Melbourne shows that the number one complaint for walking experience in Melbourne was in fact overcrowding. Um, obviously, in a pandemic, people, again, will prefer to have more space between them. And we think the Victorian government can, can support the city of Melbourne to continue to free up greater space for walkers, including the use of parking spots um, or changing the mix of road and pedestrian traffic on specific routes. Um, it could even include streets that prioritise foot traffic or even sectioning off some streets for public and active transport use. And one particular thing the Victorian government could do to assist in this is by optimising the state controlled roads, so they're kind of your Flinders, William, uh, Victoria and Spencer streets, to best enable traffic flow around those roads, which will be more heavily allocated to active transport. Next slide, thanks. This brings us to government collaboration and leadership. So we think that the government should continue to monitor and regulate working from home levels to ensure workplaces remain safe. And we don't talk much about that because that's really a public um, health issue. But we also think that there's opportunity here for the government to provide leadership and nudges towards greater flexible work through processes, through public campaigns, through collaboration with industry and the use of the VPS as an example of best practice. Um, as an example of what I'm talking about, um, there are government regulations around, around the environment, but we know that many people do more than is required by law because they consider the wider implications of their actions and because of the standard that's set in social norms. And in a similar way, government can kind of set the bar and also set some standards by what it, what it promotes by working with other industries and by what it does in its own workforces. Um, this could look like government campaigns around the benefits of increased working from home, um, accreditation for flexible workplaces, for workplaces that kind of offer more flexible hours, as we've talked about earlier, through collaborating with peak bodies, industries and unions to encourage greater working from home as well. Um, and through mechanisms such as these, the government could keep the social benefits of greater workplace flexibility at the front of people's minds, as well as appealing to the significant number of natural incentives for both employers and employees, which includes things like lower office related costs for employers and reducing commuting time and travel expenses, and not to mention the current health benefits and reduced risks 
Um, and, and one of the obvious ways that government can do this is by using its own workforce. So the VPS employees around almost 5% um, of, of workers in the CBD. And you know, we'll, there'll be talks about people coming back to the office and when they're encouraged to come back to the office. And essentially by the government using its own workforce to say, we think these are some of the things that you should offer. These are some of the ways that you should work. It can set an example, and some of the um, key things that you know we think that you'd want to watch out for is, is around workplace uh, flexibility, um, particularly in things like start and end times, but also in days of the work of the week that you choose to to commute. So you know there is um, some evidence, some evidence coming out of um, say the committee for uh, Sydney, which did a survey and found that quite a number of employees expected that their employees would come back and work in the office, mostly from Tuesday to Thursday. And what what that will, will do is, what you see in this modelling would be much worse if people's work from home days were all on the same days and people's you know work from the office or commuting days are all on the same days. Um, if everyone comes into the city on say, you know the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, then that congestion is gonna be uh, much worse, particularly if people are avoiding public transport still. So through these kinds of things, um, the government can, by its own example, say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do to encourage people to work um, from home in a, in a way that's most sustainable for, for the city. Next slide, thanks. So that wraps up our policy responses. I am going to hand back over to Jonathan now. He can lead us thanks to the next much. section. Great, thank you, Dan um, and and Neil. That was that was great to take us through there. And now we're joined by Maddie Brennan. And so, Maddie um, has been having a look at the questions that you've been uh, typing and, and sending through. And so she's going to field those to us, keep those questions coming. And and as I said, um, if we don't get to all of them, um, we'll uh, try to um, certainly cover as much as we can, and we'll have opportunities to to answer some of your other questions in other ways uh, after the webinar. Over to you, Maddie. Great, thanks Jonathan. Um, there's some cracking questions here, so I hope we can get through them all. So try and keep your answers brief if you can. Um, the first question I'm gonna to direct to Neil, which is just, the modelling was based on Melbourne um, and you took some examples from Sydney, but um, Michael Kennedy's just raised the point that Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, having not experienced significant lockdowns, will probably not experience these type of trends in PT use and congestion. Do you agree with that? Point and question. Agree, yeah, and and that's why we take a holistic picture of multiple cities. So sure, others may may not have such an impact in COVID nineteen, but I think, especially looking at the Sydney case, a far more relevant case um, to Melbourne at the time of doing that work. So, it, 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 there was quite a lot of data sets that we had to try and uh, go through on this. We also looked at things like seasonality of data. So, you know, people might be moving a bit more in summer compared to the winter months. There's a lot of different factors that we tried to balance out in, in that assumption work. And hopefully um, we've seen it play out briefly in our second recovery, but what we're looking at in the future is hopefully those, those assumptions that we've made starting to come true as we head into the recovery period. And I'll just also throw in there that you know, places like Perth, which have had very limited lockdowns, as I'm sure we're all acutely aware in Victoria, um, you know, their public transport use has still suffered during the pandemic. So, you know, coming out of it, we it's still something that I think will be an issue. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, Neil, I'll also, just as a data question for you, um, and this is from James Nevin, his question is relating to how confident you are in the assertion that the workplace activity is going to recover between 80 and 90% of pre-COVID levels. Um, he's just um, questioning that because of the level un of uncertainty that seems to be uh, around this discussion at the moment and what that means for policymakers. Sure. The level of certainty is always the big question. And that's why we did sensitivity testing. That's why we looked at two different levels of working from home. In the results, we essentially saw a similar trend, a similar pattern. Um, so look, we can be confident in a lot of these, uh, we can be confident in the research that we did to inform what Melbourne's recovery 
will look like. Now, this is scenario modeling. So that's why we present those multiple different sensitivity tests. And look, the future will tell which of those scenarios or somewhere in between we're going to land. So we'll see that in the coming months, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, I also had a question from, I think this is also from James. Uh, it's related to um, the implications of off-peak fares for public transport modelling. Daniel, perhaps I can throw that one to, uh, sorry, the implications of off-peak fares for public transport funding. Um, what does it mean in terms of the business model for transport operators if more people are both riding to work and using off-peak fares? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, and I'm sure that one of the, you know, enduring problems that like, operators will be thinking about is, you know, that without any intervention, public transport use is down. So what does that mean for them? Um, they are pretty shielded, like very shielded from kind of fair revenue. And what we find in Victoria is um, that, you know, fair revenue makes up a very small proportion of transport costs. So operating costs alone um, are only covered 30% by fares before you get into infrastructure and things like that. So what we're really thinking about is what's what's the way to make the best use of the transport system that we have? And that's really the, 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 the question that we've been tackling. And also we find that off-peak fares, um, you know, alongside other fare reforms, doesn't necessarily have to cost um, money. You can do it in a fair revenue neutral way if you want to. Um, and what we also see is that by having off-peak fares, you obviously lose some revenue from that, but you also pick up revenue because there are actually more users. And so our previous research, we found there were an extra 56,000 public transport users a day um, with off-peak fares and 100,000 extra trips in the off-peak um, with off-peak fares. So I think that the, the revenue implications are actually not particularly significant, particularly when you look at the challenges that we, we face um, should we not reform the way that we do public transport. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions related to um, the adoption of bikes in during COVID. Um, Jackie Pistacki from VTAG has pointed out that 1.7 million bicycles were purchased in 2020, uh, and the fact that 65% of jobs are actually not in the CBD. So I just wanted to perhaps throw to Jonathan in the first instance just to comment on you know, the implications of, and how we get more people actually riding to work in the suburbs. Yeah, it's, it's a good point, Jackie. And um, uh, I think uh, Dan and Neil and I have certainly experienced that in our local bike shop uh, in terms of the, of the demands uh, there too. And so it highlights a few things. Firstly, that you've got, a, you've got an open door here, right? In that um, lots of people have got on their bikes during COVID for a combination of, of travel and recreation. Um, and that is something that is uh, gives us another um, sense of encouragement about the ability for people to change their habits about how they get to work in the ways um, that Neil and Daniel were describing. It is absolutely also re relevant to, to how we get around in the suburbs because the um, increased congestion that we're seeing on the roads isn't just in the inner city, it's certainly the worst in, in inner Melbourne, but we are seeing um, even just in from the last few days and the data we can see from you know, Apple and Google Mobility and TomTom sort of data, we're seeing greater congestion as people get back in their cars, often to do quite short trips. And so the similar principles apply that, uh, around um, the safety of being able to get around local neighbourhoods. And so, um, you know, it's government policy about encouraging 20 minute neighbourhoods. And there is a lot of talk about living locally, particularly if what we're seeing in the future from here on is that mix of people travelling to, to, to their work a few days a week where they're able to work from home, but also being home other days and, and living and shopping more locally. That means that some of those principles about safe cycling infrastructure um, and about connected open spaces so that when you want to not ride on the road in a separated path the way we as Daniel were describing but perhaps going through your suburbs through a network of linked open spaces that is also really attractive for people and becomes even more important in this new era where more people want to get on their bike. Mm. 
Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. And just a follow up to the question on that one, um, the impact of separated cycle lane, uh, cycle lanes on um, congestion. We know that um, there are particular routes that have very heavy um, traffic. Um, what's your view on the impacts of those separated bike lanes and, and where do you put them basically to reduce congestion? Yeah, it's a good question and, and there's not a single answer because it depends on the context of, of where those lanes are going in, right? And what the other um, mobility options are that are available. Um, so um, there's some roads in the city uh, across Melbourne whose priority should be, you know, for traffic to efficiently get from A to B. And those are roads that we shouldn't be putting separated cycling lanes in or encouraging people to cycle in. Also, we shouldn't be allowing people to park their cars there um, and, and effectively taking up that lane. There's other places, particularly in the CBD or the access routes to the CBD, where there is a rich range of transport opportunities already with public transport that we can see we're underutilising. Um, and that there are real benefits, you know, social, environmental and economic benefits from more people riding into those areas. And so we oughtn't be encouraging more people to drive into the CBD. That is not the way of the future. That is not going to create a functional inner, inner Melbourne. So that's a good example of a location where actually having safe separated cycling lanes makes a lot of sense now and will continue to in the future. Thank you. Um, Daniel, I'll throw this question to you from Michael. Um, what mechanism uh, are paid, uh, sorry, by what mechanism are people paid to cycle to work in the examples that you gave? Yes, yeah, so there's, um, there's, there's some varied ones across, across, across the U Europe and across the world. The one in Belgium is essentially, um, employers will pay them, say, uh, 23 cents a kilometre that's tax deductible to the employer and subsidised by the government. It's a bit com complicated. But essentially in, in our context, it could be something like uh, similar where the government would do it through a payroll tax reduction, uh, or it could just be a really straightforward one where you just directly pay um, people for a trial using gift cards or you know credits and things like that. Um, other things that have been done, say in the UK, is subsidising capital purchases, um, equipment, um, obviously, one of the catches there is, you know, are they actually going to use that to commute to work or are they just going to use that um, on the weekend? So there's some of the reasons we kind of prefer the, the activity-based method, such as they have in Belgium. But yeah, there's a range of ones basically from quite complex to really, really straightforward. Okay, thanks for that. I'm just really mindful that we've hit time. So um, I might just hand over to you, Jonathan, to wrap up. Yeah, great. Thank you, Maddie. Um, and um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. And we will be sending out a short survey too in the next few days. And, and we'd really appreciate that if you could fill out time because we, we take that feedback seriously um, to improve our future address, uh, future events. Um, if there's any burning questions that yeah we haven't got to that you'd really like to, um, to, to um, ask us or you've got thoughts that you want to get in touch, please feel free to email us um, at the it's inquiries at infrastructurevictoria.com.au. Um, and of course, you can find the full report here and more detail about behind the modelling and so forth um, at our website, which is infrastructurevictoria.com.au. Um, and of course, also, please feel free to interact with us further on social media, in particular LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I'd like to also very much thank um, Neil and Dan and, and Maddie for their contributions in, in making this a, a very successful webinar today. So thank you everyone and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Hope to see you at a webinar again or some other event soon. Thanks everyone.